crowbars on people. So I'm kind of sad about that, but uh, I don't know. I guess we can get a crowbar or something. All right, so here's me giving you guys the practice exam. The volume better work. Nice. All right. Then there's another, there's another good one. All right. So like I said, spoilers if you haven't seen it, but it's your fault. Um, it's your fault if you haven't seen it. All right. So yeah, this year's exam three is a little different because we have population genetics and lots of long answer questions because the other faculty gave me shit. So now I've created exam three. It's me with it. It's terrifying. No. Very. Oh my God, it's so much harder than last year's. Yes. Terrifying. That's it. Oh no, it's not as funny. Okay. <laughs> let's do some, let's just like, let's find the dog quick. Yeah, let's just, yeah, we're just going to chill for a bit. All right. Anyway, I don't think it's going to be too bad. Actually, in the editing, I think I pulled off a lot of dumb questions from last year's that like were kind of like, mm. how helpful really is that to you being a better scientist, med medical professional, et cetera? So that's okay. Anyway, break time's over. So how can this matter? This is also gonna serve as sort of an intro to phylogenase for us. Not that you didn't have a few of those in 106, right? You did, you have seen fly of phylogenase before, right? What the hell? What are you guys doing 105 and 106? What the hell? God damn it! I have heard that it's been skipped, that DNA to RNA to protein was not made available. Hence why we spend our time here. Anyways, let's take a look at a semi-fun like story alongside some learning here. So, biggest deal to come from the genome. Medicine, sure but it's our best look at a past that we otherwise have no artifacts from, or very few. People have heard of Neanderthals. Fewer have heard of Denisovans. To remember though, we are Homo sapiens. In the beginning, when Homo sapiens first emerged in East Africa, there were six standing up hominid species. Today, there is one, us. How and why? The genomes aligned right here of Denisovans and Neanderthals quite closely near our own, but it's the differences between them that we can infer from ours that are important. So, like we've seen before, SNPs, single nucleotide changes, some of those are localized. So in this, in the example individual here, they've got, for example, plenty of SNPs that are located in these regions, right? That peoples in these regions, based on statistical control, They've seen that the genome of this person is enriched for SNPs of those peoples. Same thing over here with the purple. That's how 23andMe works. This essentially says, here's your DNA differences. Here's where statistically those might come from and lie. Now, again, when you do 23andMe, the confidence in stats on localized SNPs with humans is tough. Humans are not a very, we're pretty young species to say the least. So it's, it's a stretch to say one SNP is for one peoples, right? We migrate a lot too. Now, taking a look at this though, we do have to address how phylogenies work. Remember, time passes as you read a phylogeny. What is left on the right is who is still surviving. So if species E actually cut off right there where I'm kind of scratching it off, it means that species E didn't make it to present day where I've scratched that right there. Let's say in red is their end right there. What we can also infer from this is species B and C, for example, are more closely related than species A and B, right? But that species A, B, and C, once there was one thing that would eventually splinter. Notice as well in the red, sometimes, and in rare events, we get something called horizontal transfer. 
sometimes species or closely related species can contribute genetically to one another in rare events. Should it be possible to form the zygote? But if I asked you, who is the last common ancestor of D, E, F, G, and H, which one of those is there? Is that one? The last time that all of them were sort of in the same boat, before they ever existed, you have to zoom back in time. You have to say, it's not here, it's not four, it's all three, right? And at one point, back in time, Three was one of the only ones in this species like phylogram, this clade, right? Whatever species three was no longer truly exists. That's what it means for last common ancestor. They don't exist anymore. The splinter happened over time. So that's the thing that people always get confused. It's like, is that spe is B are, did B and C, did B like become C? No. This thing split. Okay, that's sort of the basics of reading these. There's plenty of other things that can get a little, a little more heinous if you decide to become a zoo major. But for the most part, phylogenies are a very good way to visualize who's related to who and how far away, and over time, who made it. So we started to build these. We started to have molecular informing, right? There's a human, there's a chimpanzee, and there's an orangutan. Now, there's one thing on here that we can't actually know. We don't have this DNA, right? We don't have five million years ago DNA. But what we can look at is say, okay, if we bounce backwards in time though, and check the orangutan, and at that position right there, it maintains the guanine. At this position over here, there was a split though. What you can infer from things like this is that the change happened on that human side. If the original group matches the other close group, and then the change happens over here, you can infer that during Homo sapiens time, as they were, as we, they were splintering, that change happened in that time period, somewhere in there. Same thing can happen here. Here's us zoomed in a little bit. We often hear chimpanzees next to humans, but there's another type of primate called bonobo. They actually behave quite a bit more like humans. Chimpanzees are violent and like tear off limbs and other things when they get in fights. Bonobos are a lot more cooperative. They're kind of chill. As upset as we are with each other sometimes, Nobody in the room has ever torn any limbs off, I suppose. So we are a closer reflection sometimes of a bonobo. But what we can see is that changes, even in a single gene, we can map what missenses have occurred over time. What missenses separate these two versus ones that all happened on our wing, basically. And so the number of changes typically indicates more time, typically. Mutations are a slow thing. So I'm going to say number of mutations approximately is going to mean a higher time period has passed since that event. As you can tell, there are fewer splits between chimpanzees and bonobos. They were a closer split less time ago than was the split from the common ancestor of all three. So, and remember, don't let this make you feel dehumanized. Like it's, humans are different and unique, trust me. But seeing it from the molecular side can give you a look inside why, which I think is special. Okay, here we go. When I was a kid, they'd always show shows and be like, oh no, we don't have the missing link. Then we found Lucy, the little standing Australopithecus skeleton. I got to see it one time when I was traveling abroad. It was beautiful. It was the first missing fossil record of what we could infer 
was something between, something that would fill sort of this gap between standing and not standing. Oh, it's red on red, it's horrible. Now, again, this is mainly practiced with phylogenies too. So let's actually see a couple things happen here. So assuming about five and a half million years ago, something, one thing is running around. There's some sort of split here. We'll notice that we find certain bones, fossils from certain things. Notice that some of the lines end, right? That species ends as far as any evidence that it can, doesn't exist anymore, didn't exist anymore in that time. It's the last fossil we found of it and they don't exist now. The line ends. We start getting up a little more familiar up here. This is where standing up begins. This is where tools begin with habilis on the right, but truly erectus on the left. Notice though, after that split, where erectus splits and then it becomes homo sapiens and neanderthals, erectus doesn't last much longer. This is what I mean about the story that the, only the genes can tell. Notice as well, obviously, there's their ending, there's their ending. Here's us. So there was very much a coexistence for a long time. Now, story begins basically out of fossils and genes. Is that Homo erectus in Africa was the first one that could actually sort of manage itself in high populations. About 10,000 years ago, as far as Homo sapiens go, there were one, two, possibly three crossings across the Levant and Fertile Crescent, through Europe, through Asia, and then eventually Oceania, the, late, the last one. And then all Homo sapiens come from these peoples that would dominate Africa, but then leave. This is a link, it's a fun little video. Notice that Erectus's lines died in Africa as Homo sapiens took over. That is part of the story. Not enough food for everybody, basically. Okay, so we have three genomes to look at then. We have humans like us. We have Denisovan DNA. That's out in sort of Asia, Oceania. We have Neanderthal DNA from the caves. We can put together the entire Neanderthal genome. We can put together a working version of the Denisovan genome. We can see from these splits the Neanderthals and Denisovans actually crossed out of Africa before Homo sapiens did and populated before us. And the mostly the behavior that we can tell from things is that they lived in semi-isolated but semi-familiar group, groups across the world. So in this case, when the first time came that we, were, we started getting the Neanderthal genome, this was a huge deal because this could tell us this would make sense then that peoples from sort of Eurasia, and Russia, that area, Europe would have more Neanderthal DNA than those from peoples from Africa, right? We found that. And that's why to this day, out of Africa is sort of our prevailing hypothesis. So talk about sequencing. This is tough. When we typically do sequencing, we got plenty of fresh cheek cells and DNA, right? Let's take a look at what we had in the caves in France or some of the other places in Europe or somewhere in Oceania with the Denisovan stuff. Very, 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 very little. And guess what? Over time, fungus are around the bones, right? Bacteria are around the bones. So we have to reference their genomes and pull them out of the sequencing. Equally, you guys wanna know why we never recover DNA from places along the equator typically? Too hot. Tissue melts. DNA eventually dies. You need some more cold. That's the problem. And that's why certain parts of our story are kind of lost to time. So first breakthrough, piece by piece by piece, the mitochondrial DNA of a Neanderthal was put together, the whole thing, all 16,000 base pairs. And you can kind of tell, like we've been doing, the reeds, right? The reeds and how they kind of stack on top of each other. And we can build a consensus sequence even if it's only out of maybe 20 reads at a time. So it's pretty cool. Started finding out a little bit more about Neanderthals and that they're not, they are very different than Homo sapiens. They truly are. 
Because what we started to find as we found more bones and we had more samples was that Neanderthals lived in groups, like little, little regional family groups. They didn't migrate or mix very much. What that tells us is that they weren't very social. They weren't very tolerant of other groups, basically. This is a pattern in mammals. Orca pods don't like other orca pods. Chimps don't like other chimp groups. Wolf packs don't like other wolves. Typically, most packs with mammals will break down around 100, 150 because the family ties start to die. But here's the big one. After we sequenced the full Neanderthal genome, we started to find that pieces of it were in our genome. When we sequenced the Denisovan genome, when we found those in India and Asia, we found that there was Neanderthal DNA in them too. This tells another story. It tells the story that as Homo sapiens emerged out of Africa in that, that first and second crossing, there were interactions. PG-13, you can infer. So to this day, most of us have a lot, quite a decent chunk of Neanderthal contribution within each of us. But don't get it wrong, they were, very, they were very different than Homo sapiens. But each one of these are events from each one of the individuals that we found of the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Unfortunately, we do have one sample that we don't know what it is. Could be that sixth group that you always, or seventh group you hear about sometimes. But each of these are giant crossing over events or horizontal transfers of genetic info. One of the Denisovans we found was almost like a quarter Neanderthal. It was crazy. So that meant that the groups did travel and interact sometimes. There's another kind of visualization of that with sort of a nice little triangle phylogeny. That potential unknown right here is down on my bottom right, contributing somehow to the Denisovan genome because we know that because of this split, we have the Neanderthal genome, the whole thing, and we have the contribution that one time, but if there was a missing piece, it means that something else, a seventh hominid, was somewhere running around. Pretty neat. We have all the events where Denisovans also, same thing with Neanderthals in Europe, Denisovans, people of Asia and Oceania share quite a bit of Denisovan DNA. To this day, people from the Tibetan regions share a gene that is specific for altitude that is in the Denisovan DNA that crossed into Homo sapien DNA and is the only Homo sapien region that that crossed over in. Now, biggest deal to this day, Neanderthal genes that were super important, something called toll-like receptors, immune genes. These are immune genes that we only see in the Neanderthal genome and only Homo sapiens with those Neanderthal genome sets. This is because Europe was cold and squalorous, and there was poop and stuff everywhere. And so the Neanderthals developed sort of immunity over time that there was an advantage to have inherent defenses against some of these bugs. Because winters can make things a little sicker, mostly. Now, it's all not all good news. Um, Neanderthal DNA also um, causes type 2 diabetes sometimes with certain genes. So trade off. Not great. Now, this is the other cool thing. At the sites, some of the Neanderthal sites, we would get interference. When we would sequence some of the bones and some of the sites, we would see one other thing. We kept seeing plant material. Specifically, we would see that this tissue came from the petals of flowers. Lots of them at once in one spot. What does that imply about what Neanderthals were? Did they have what they, what they were like? It's kind of the beautiful part of the story that they buried their dead and they had culture, they had ideas, right? They had ceremony, they cared, right? So it's an odd thing to think, how human are they? Like I said, about, there's about one to 2% maybe in you that's roughly Neanderthal genomics. Putting everyone that we have together of that, about 40% of the Neanderthal genome exists collectively to this day. Zooming in on a look at chromosome nine here, we can see all kinds of fun stuff happening. It's all kinds of little contributions that each person has basically.
Now, Denise even, same thing. This kind of confirms that certain regions associated with certain DNA would be enriched in people's homo sapiens of those regions, given that their far ancestors would have interacted as they spread throughout. And we do see that. The heaviest contribution being New Zealand and Papua New Guinea and Australia and those native peoples there. So based on the fossil map, based on everything we've got, these are about the sites of interaction. Neanderthals in blue, Denisovans in red, that when Homo sapiens made that first and then second cross, they would go and have those interactions. Now, like we know, there were friendly interactions, but we're the only ones left. So think about what that possibly could have been. But there's one other thing, and I've talked this up big before. Having our genome, looking at the Neanderthal genome, crossing those two, we can see what we have that they don't, right? We can see what made us different. You're looking at three of those genes. You'll hear the sort of little urban myth that neurons don't divide ever. That's not true. Neurons can renew and divide in emergencies. And in fact, species like us that have a lot of plasticity that we can change, these genes can do that. So you can take a reference genome from the Neanderthals and a reference from us, and we can tell Cask 5, Spag 5, and Kif 18. What they do is during mitosis, they sort of allow for decisions to be made quicker on that cell division. They accelerate our neurons' ability to survive, essentially, and to change, more importantly. That's why you should always respect crows when you see them. Their brains are sort of built on the same baseline as ours, that they can change to the new situation. New neuron paths can take over for what was instinct. So what you're looking at, essentially, is that Homo sapiens don't rely on instincts. Neanderthals still did in a lot of ways. Not in every way. Tools, burying the dead, it was all still there. Another set of genes that emerged that we saw we had tons of changes in. Who's ever heard of a myelin sheath, right, from Fizz, right? It keeps the neurons firing, right? It does more than that. The genes that we have can do all kinds of things. You can consider this more blue, green text, but again, this is genes that we can find using the reference that are unique. So we have genes that are faster at suddenly myelinating something quickly. We have genes that can replace dead myelin sheath. Ours are better. They're more attractive, more angry to do that. You can thicken myelin sheath too. You can make it stronger in certain areas and certain connections. And see how all of these are happening in real time. You can lengthen, shorten, and you can change where your little nodes of Ranvier are. We have this. The others don't so much. We have these genes that can control this process and make this process essentially just less fixed. And that's inherent in the nature too. We are less fixed as organisms, as animals. We can change, we can learn new things. We're not built by the neurons that we're born with. So, last little bit. We also sadly found that, well, as, as far as mammals go, uh, humans are not very genetically diverse, shoot. Not, not by a long shot compared to other mammals, sadly. Now, there's a reason for this, and it ties in the whole story. So, in the beginning, in East Africa, probably Namibia somewhere, there came a group of Homo sapiens that was an offshoot of Erectus. Erectus was in Africa at this point. For some reason, they could collect. They could be in a group past 100. They could be in a group of 1,000 maybe 10,000, that's here. That first event, why we are sort of at a bottleneck, why we started from so few, is that there was a group that would come together and didn't break into pieces and didn't re-migrate. They stayed, they cooperated. You've seen how beautiful like pack animals can be. We did something different though. Something kept Homo sapiens together the way it couldn't Neanderthals and it couldn't Denisovans and it couldn't Erectus. From this point, that's event number one that makes us a little bit undiverse. We have one beginning in one spot because remember mitochondrial haplogroups? 
that's where they all lead to L0, is right from peoples of those regions. The Eve that we have existed somewhere in that region. Now, non-diversity number two. There's only about two, three documented crossings into the Levant, one of which we do actually think Neanderthals beat us back into Africa on. Because the story goes, here's another cool thing about Neanderthals. They didn't have bow and arrows. Do you know why they're so stocky and kind of thick? It's because they'd fight woolly mammoths, tigers, and woolly rhinoceros by hand with spears. We never found bows and arrows, but they were killing these things. So when it would come to Homo sapien versus Neanderthal, we'd lose most of the time. But we had something that they didn't, a larger group behind us to think and cooperate and re-strategize. So the crossings would eventually succeed. But again, that's why anybody that came across in that crossing right there, it's only from like two, two groups or so. Okay. This is sort of the end of this, of this uh, part of today. When we started this journey here, when that began, Homo erectus was still in Africa. Neanderthals were still in Europe. Denisovans were still in Asia Oceana. Two other species that we've seen, unknowns. Today, there's one. Why? You can kind of think to yourself about it. Um, it's one of those things that can only, it's a story that can only be told strangely through fossils and genomics, where people spread and how and why. But the consensus is, we don't like sharing, do we? Eventually, somebody had to eat. That's the idea. Now, Consider this to yourself, and this is one of those green text philosophical questions I can always ask you. Was that genocide? So we something to think about with what that story was. And remember, this is thousands of years occurring over time though. But can you imagine a different world where there would be different hominid species? It's always like the first time I went through these, it's always hard to like question what makes you human, right? And what Neanderthals and Denisovans were. They weren't animals, they weren't homo sapiens. The genes only tell so much of that story. They give us the closest look. But the rest is sort of for you to kind of decide on and think. So I'm going to go ahead and take a break for a bit. We'll start with population genetics in about one or two minutes.
super thrilled about the 8 a.m. either, so it's okay. Hopefully there's no nurses in our room again. That would be bad. Because then I'd actually get them out of there. <laughs> All right, so population genetics. Hooray. At this point, changes in gene alleles seemingly seem only for the animal and plant people, but I mean, come on, COVID has changes, diseases have changes, cancer has changes, people have changes, we're fine. Think about examples that you can anchor to as we go through, that'll kind of help. But, hooray, time to pop some how species exist, how they like get away from each other, how we bring new species and how we can track that using molecular stuff. Is all the old good ways. This is without any DNA sequencing that Darwin gave a shot to. See, I think, I think I want more coffee. Oh my God, I don't know, I couldn't think of a joke. Let's get out of here. All right, so basic notes here. He didn't come up with like some crazy world bending thing. It was just basically like, hey, the current stuff must have come from something long ago. They didn't all just pop up here. Something had to show up before this thing was here. And this journey, that's when he and Wallace later, you don't hear about Wallace a ton, but he went in, got a ton of samples from South America. As he's returning, the ship sank, though. Um, he escaped, but not all his stuff. Sad. But they collaborated to basically say, the diversity in species means that something can't come from nothing. There must have been an ancestor. Lamarck was a French guy, like we talked about, that was like, hey, no, you can change. Individuals can change, not populations. Darwin's population over time, Lamarck is now organism. We know now, think about how Lamarck can be true now, right? Organisms can react in real time, right? We actually know that. It's a good exam question. How was Lamarck right? We saw organisms change to survive, right? Plants activating genes during drought. Mammals going through trauma, basically reacting stress-wise, he's not fully wrong. But species don't change over time like that. So basic observations and inferences. Number one on the left there, would have pointed there. Um, number one on the left, Ray. Individuals vary in their genetics and in their composition. There are differences in populations somehow. Now remember, Darwin's doing this without knowing what a gene is or having seen Mendel stuff. He has not seen that yet. Number two, excessive offspring. Tons, right? Living things spray off a lot of babies, specifically fungi and spores right there, right? Talk about Last of Us, scary, right? So if that's number two, that in this mass of babies that most animals are having, the ones that survive that tend to have a bit of an advantage will be the ones that then pass on what they look like and how they act and what they do. This is where you get the mischaracterization survival of the fittest. Think of something more along the lines of greater fitness of the well-adapted. There you go. Because then if you think of survival of the fittest, you think of like liver king, like surviving and stuff. And I'm just like, nah. <laughs> and trust me, with enough steroids, that guy's not actually very fit. All right. Now, in this case, over time, this is a big one. That, again, over time and slowly, and sometimes with some random pushes in certain directions, favorable traits typically will win out. Math typically wins out. So knowing this, he had the idea that over time, should the environment change, should suddenly the bird, the cactus here, right here, if suddenly its island changed on the Galapagos that now it's dry and the cactus are the most plentiful plant, it perhaps came from a species long ago that was a seeder and insect eater, but its beak happened to be that much better for eating the cactus than its brothers and sisters and its cousins. It had more babies. Those babies had more babies. And here we are. 
And over time, that radiation can change. And on each of the islands, Darwin saw this, and they were the perfect little labs, basically, that each island had an advantage and disadvantage. The finches were the first thing that looked different to take kind of seize on that. You got to remember, this is over millions of years, sometimes thousands of years stuff, right? Like, this doesn't just happen. Think about all the polygenic genes we've talked about, beak length and width and all that. Those are multiple, like, polygenic traits, right? There's not a beak gene. So over time, that's a lot of text. Don't worry, it's on the thing. You don't need it all. It's just for fun. The red text is red for the reason. Favorable traits increase survival. Survival increases babies and offspring, right? More offspring means more potential survival. Because here's the other thing. Resources are not infinite. If life had its way in an uncontained pool, living things would expand into infinity, right? Offspring would never die, and you would just have more offspring and more offspring forever. But resources run out. Things change. Disasters happen. Competition happens. Same thing happens in the environment of a patient with their antibiotics versus the bacterial cells that are trying to survive. When you have a terrible bacterial infection, there is variation in that population. They, they planned on it. And variation is heritable. And should the environment change, those ones with variation would be selected. They're the only survivors. Whoever survives is selected. They didn't try to be selected. They were just born with a certain advantage. And once the environment changed and the antibiotics showed up, now everything else comes from those originators. Same thing's gonna happen with cancer. Same thing's gonna happen with viruses, especially specifically HIV in a lot of patients. So, four key things that are happening here. The things that you need. You can't have a population of clones for this to happen. You need to be able to pass on the information So you need mitosis, you need meiosis, right? The differences will happen and when the differences happen, they'll be they'll happen because that information had been passed on and that there had been variation in the species. The same thing happens with your B cells when you are initiating an immune response. Your B cell population in your lymph nodes, there are millions of little B cells that have been varied and mutated, and they are waiting to make an antibody against something that makes you sick. And it's going to be one of them that succeeds in that. You do not direct one B cell to become better so much as you select the one that is the best. Now, evolution as it stands today is often a consequence of us. The DDT chemical people were pretty happy with themselves until we started finding out, oh no, it's the ancestors of the mosquitoes that didn't die from the spray. They're the ones that we've got left. Oops. This is similar to the example I've done before. If you spray your yard, with a bunch of stuff, what's gonna grow back? Anything that's resistant to what you just sprayed it with. And then that's gonna be your new yard. One last other thing that he noticed, artificial selection. This is more of an example though, dogs again. What he thought was basically, and then remember, he, this is before Mendel and the gene. He thought variation from the wolf must exist enough to produce these. And that if we can select for something to cause small and cuteness, for example, or big and scary, so could nature.
just through different forces and not artificially. So it means that even though an individual may exist here, the potential for what it could become, totally, totally open. Not 100% open, but yeah, the dog's not going to grow wings anytime soon, but still. A flying scout, what a nuisance that would be for me. So as far as evolution goes, we have uh, three primary bits of evidence of like who's a species, like who deviated from who. Number one, anat anatomical, do you look alike? You're more likely closer if you look alike, perfect. Developmental, do you develop alike? Does your embryo kind of develop along the same path? Last, molecular, what we just did, the phylogenies. Are you more or closely related in the, in the long clock of time and mutations to the species next to you, you know, depending on that. So these pieces have added a lot of the puzzle for us. That's been really cool. This is strictly how we do something like this, molecular homology. So on the left, you have a bunch of mammals. Starting with the reference here, us, as always, we're taking a look at the P53 cancer protein, tumor suppressor protein. Could do this to any protein. On the right, percentage of amino acids that agree with us being the reference. We're the 100%. We're the keystone here. Now, as you go down and look at each of these little individual organisms, rhesus and green monkeys, they only have a couple changes from us. If we look at rabbit and dog, though, we start to see that the changes begin to accumulate. And we start to see that changes that happened earlier, like these ones, Still sort of stay accumulating from a different path, though, a non-human path. You can start to see all these ones in here that have changed over time as we keep going all the way down to fish. But you can also see the power of some genes to actually last this long, even if they've had massive changes. So obviously on the exam, I think there's a practice of this on the little practice, right? I could ask you. Pair this with the phylogeny and tell me who's related to who, or what's who's in what position, right? It's the makings of an easy long answer. I love it, because it combines phylogenies, populations, missenses. This is our main way of tracking who came from who, who has less changes between each one. So. Where does this actual pool of variation come from? Given that we're talking about descent with modification, do we during meiosis truly give our RNA or give our protein to the next generation? No, DNA, right? The variation has to start there when you're talking Mendelian and evolution. Darwin did what he could without knowing that heredity existed with units. But the variation that exists in populations, it's due strictly to DNA. It can be in specific individuals, obviously, like we've seen, you can change based on epigenetics in a lot of ways. But the code that lasts through time, truly lasts through time, is always going to be DNA. Can't rely on epigenetics for thousands and thousands of years. Equally, single genomes, not just populations, can have tons of variation. Even looking at these examples, it doesn't look like there's a ton of variation in each, in each little example. But come on, we know tons of organisms that have tons of potential variation just within, right? means that using the same DNA, we can select and select and select for that gigantic size versus the little tiny chihuahua. And that reservoir all comes from DNA and the changes that might exist in a population. So the reservoir that you can select from always exists as a sort of a DNA question if you are measuring this over a long period of time. We've seen this before, just like us in humans. 
again, though, we're a very young species, so our clock is not wound very, very much. The genetics that we have can typically not be as strong as some other mammals or other, um, other animals. But over time, if you can tell that different individuals have different spots and maybe different advantages, it's perfect. So there's variation in gene pools. That's what we call genetic diversity. You want diversity because if something happens and maybe only the yellows are gonna survive it, you need that. You need somebody to carry on the species. Because if you have too many changes or something, diversity is not gonna last through some of those. One of those changes is always the sad example of natural selection. Let's say Pac-Man shows up, mainly eats greens and blues. It was better to be red in this case. Pac-Man's scared of red maybe. The sad example is always the mice on the lava rock getting eaten by the hawk. If you guys click on the syllabus and do the little module for this week's, it's a little game where you can play and change the rock and the little like a little owl will come and like eat mice and stuff. It's kind of sad. I remember the first time I played it in class and Gustavus, somebody like let out like a little cry because the owl was like swoop and it like ate it. And I was like, oh, dang. All right, so we'll carry on next week here, Ray.